thyself sultanically among the moons of Saturn, and take high abstracted man alone, and he seems a wonder, a grandeur, and a woe. But from the same point, take mankind in mass, and for the most part they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates, both contemporary and hereditary. But most humble though he was, and far from furnishing an example of the high, humane abstraction, the Pequod's carpenter was no duplicate. Hence, he now comes in person on this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to McNulty's Book Corral. I'm your host, Thomas McNulty, and today we're going to be discussing one of the great American novels, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. I just read the opening paragraph from chapter 107, which is titled The Carpenter. I was reading it from this edition, which is just a standard edition I picked up at Barnes & Noble, because the print is large and it was easy to read, so to speak. All right, so let's get into this. Moby Dick, written by Herman Melville, is one of the great American novels, one of my favorites. I've read this many times. Yes, I own multiple copies. I have this one, then I have this one, and this is the really funny part to me because, you know, I'm a book collector, as you know. I own two copies of the Norton Critical Edition. I don't know how I ended up with two copies of the Norton Critical Edition, but I did, and here they are. And I also have somewhere, I don't know where, somewhere I have a fifth copy. I, it's buried somewhere in a stack under dust and books and cobwebs and whatever. Who knows what I'll find when I go in there. You know, that's always the excitement of being a, being a book collector is you find stuff, okay? Sometimes you think, oh yeah, I forgot I had that. So anyways, um, right off the bat, Moby Dick is a really difficult book to read for a lot of people. It is, a, it is considered a classic of literature, and I do highly recommend it. It takes a little work, however. So with that said, I do recommend the Norton Critical Edition for your home library. Easily found on Amazon. Again, I don't know how I ended up with with two copies and then this one and then somewhere else another one. Now let's talk about Herman Melville for a moment. Herman Melville was born in 1819 and he died in 1891. Moby Dick was his, I believe it was his sixth book. I have some notes here. He published Typey, Omu, Marty, Redburn, and White Jacket. And then in 1851 he published Moby Dick, which was a critical failure. Uh, it was not given good reviews in general. Prior to that, his other books were given generally positive reviews, and Melville was on his way to becoming a popular writer. But then with Moby Dick, he did something that many of you creative types may understand. He threw away the conventions, his, or he set them aside, and he decided to write a book his way. He just had things to say and he wanted to do it in a different way so what we ended up with was this incredible book Moby Dick it's a big one all right so Melville used every type of literary device known to him at the time to tell the story of Ahab the story is obviously something you may be familiar with Ahab lost his leg in a battle with the great white whale and he's on a vengeance to find the whale and kill it Okay, Ishmael enters the scene and he takes himself on board and he goes off on a whaling trip and the story unfolds from there. And he's the last survivor of the ship and he is the one that tells the tale. These plot devices are not unknown to most of you that have seen the famous movie directed by John Huston starring Gregory Peck and with a screenplay written by the great Ray Bradbury. It's actually a good film. Um, I know that Gregory Peck is on record saying he never really liked his performance in the film, but I think the film holds up, and I think he's quite good as Ahab. There are other film versions as well. Anyways, take a look at that. Um, what Melville did is incredible. You know, He begins the book with a series of extracts, and by that, these extracts are quotations that he put in the beginning a series of quotations and it goes on for pages and pages and this relates to whales and the whaling industry so they're like epigrams for the beginning little quotations to set the scene 
on the whaling industry. In fact, the book is almost an encyclopedia of knowledge on the whaling industry in addition to telling a story of Ahab. All right, So he uses Ahab in the story of vengeance as a, as a framework to tell this story. Melville himself was a sailor. He did do some stints on whaling ships, and he was quite familiar with the sea. Many of his other books relate to the sea and so, and so forth. Um, all of his books are worth reading, by the way. But Mo, Moby Dick was a critical failure, and it's because he, he chose these different elements to tell the story. All right, 1851, so this is before the Civil War. This book is out there, and it you know it nosedived, um, and that caused a lot of a lot of concern for Melville, from what I understand. Um, the book features many elements. Um, uh, it's an encyclopedia on the whaling industry. It has many Shakespearean elements, such as Chapter Forty, which is Midnight on the Forecastle, which is a play. And so you're reading this narrative. All of these different chapters, you know, telling different stories about different characters and so forth, sometimes coming back to Ahab and so forth later on. A lot of characters in the book. And then all of a sudden he has a play. And he does this frequently. In fact, that little bit that little bit from uh, uh, The Carpenter, the chapter called The Carpenter that I read, you'll note that uh, the way he introduced The Carpenter on into the scene was a Shakespearean element. And so enters The Carpenter. Um but chapter 40 is a play, and he does this throughout. So he has different elements. You have a narrative structure, you have characterizations, you have symbolism, etc. You have a lot of mythology, you have a lot of whaling information, very detailed, accurate information on whaling. Again, Melville was on a whaling ship. And all of that come, comes together to create this incredible mosaic. It's those various creative elements that make Moby Dick the masterpiece that it is. M many people, including myself, would argue that if, narr if the narrative had structure had been traditional, just the, you know, here's the tale of Ahab and what happens, it wouldn't have had the impact uh, on American letters, although the impact took decades and decades. In fact, Moby Dick and Melville really didn't get the literary reconsideration uh, on his greatness until after his death, uh, after the turn of the century. Um, these are things that you can look up yourself. Now, I want to give you some tips on how to read the book. Because when people uh, read the book, and I recommend this book all the time to people, they're always hesitant to read it. They start it and then they have to set it aside because they're confused by the different elements. So I do recommend, of course, the Norton Anthology to give you some background on these elements. Uh, it's good to be familiar with Shakespeare and literary devices, symbolism, and so forth. Understand that this is a book that's not traditional, uh, and therein lies its allure as well. You know, it, it takes time to read it. My recommendation, a few tips to read Moby Dick from start to finish, is to read the book one chapter at a time and then stop. All right, don't read don't read two chapters, you know, and then go on to three. Don't try and read multiple chapters in a night. Many of the chapters are short. Some of them are long. Some of them are medium length. So there are 135 chapters in Moby Dick. And, you know, just tackling one chapter at a time will get you there. Give yourself a year. All right? Give yourself a year. And say, okay, this week I'm going to read one chapter. The next, and you can read other stuff in between the chapters. Whatever you want to do, you want to go read one of Thomas McNulty's westerns. <laughs> Sorry, you know, I had to had to throw that in, uh, or one of Peter Brandvold, <laughs> one of Peter Brandvold's westerns. Great, uh, whatever you're doing. But Moby Dick is worth your time to to pursue. Uh, I recommend one chapter at a time and take notes. What are the things about the chapter that you just read that you understand? What are the elements? What are the symbolisms? What are the styles? What are the ideas? What are the themes? What are the motifs that you just encountered? Keep a journal of your reading when you're reading Moby Dick, you know, and then you'll get through it. Do it that way. Take notes. You know, if you encounter things that you don't understand, obviously in this day and age, you can Google those things you don't understand and you can learn from there. Uh, so it's, you know, re Moby Dick is a learning experience, even for highly skilled readers. And I'm, I consider myself a highly skilled reader. 
I've been tackling this stuff for all well just a couple of years so never mind how long but uh, but um, Moby Dick continuously fascinates me as does Melville you know if you're interested in Melville I recommend some of his other um, his other works uh, he has a short story that I'm every I think every member of the literati every liter literary person is familiar with Melville's short story uh, Bartleby the Scrivener uh, and when you read that, it's just an incredible piece of work. One of the all-time classic uh, short stories in literature. <clears throat> um, some of his other books later on, Benito Serino. Again, we're going to see. When you when you pick up Melville, generally you're going to see. There's a, a couple exceptions exceptions to that. Uh, Benito Serino, Bartleby the Scrivener, and Billy Budd are fantastic works. Billy Budd was published posthumously. It was discovered in his uh, files after his death. And uh, that is also considered a literary classic. Most of his work is. I'm also fond of a book he wrote that's he, where he doesn't go to see. It's called Pierre or the Ambiguities. And uh, that's an incredible book to read. Uh, again, Melville takes a little time. It takes a little work to do it. But you will be rewarded by reading him, you know. Um, it's just some of the passages are so beautifully written that when you read them, you, if you're like me, you'll stop and then you'll start to read them again. You might read them out loud to yourself. You know, the passage I, I read, the opening paragraph from chapter 107, The Carpenter, is one of the most um, fascinating passages in the book. And, and there are thousands of fascinating passages in Moby Dick. So I know that it's it's not really... Uh, a popular book with the average reader, but it can become one. The book is always in print. It's a perennial bestseller. Why not take a take a crack at it? Why not jump into Moby Dick? Why not ex explore the fascinating world of Herman Melville? Well, what a wonderful, wonderful writer he is, you know. And if you if you do that, Melville Melville can lead you down a road to other avenues in literature, and you'll tackle other great writers, Nathaniel Hawthorne, perhaps Thomas Pynchon. Thomas Pynchon, I'm just connecting Herman Melville, Moby Dick with Thomas Pynchon. Why would I do that? Well, I think Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow is comparable to Moby Dick as far as being one of the great classics of American literature. But that, my friends, is a story for another day. Thank you for checking in. Stay well, stay happy, feed your brain, read a book. Have fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm.